Good evening to everybody. My name is Neil Campbell, and uh, I'm here to chair this in conversation as part of the Salt Art Society's first book of the year award. Um, just to say, we'll get and start chatting to the two wonderful writers in just a moment, but I just want to talk a little bit about the award itself, uh, just for a brief moment. I'll introduce the writers and then we'll get into the actual conversation of it. Um, the first book of the year award is quite special, actually, in terms of all of the awards uh, overseen by the, the Salt Arts, if only because it's particularly open across genres. So we've got poetry, we've got life writing, we have sci-fi, we have histories of school teaching and wool production in Scotland. We have apocalypse in Glasgow and everything in between. Uh, and it's incredible to see so much of that still retained in the actual shortlist itself. We've got two of the shortlistees this evening, but just to give a little shout out to the others here as well, um, if we've got a moment, we have Keith Broomfield, uh, If Rivers Could Sing. There's details and information about this all on the Salt Hours website, and I really would encourage you to look at that. Keith's book here is about life writing in nature and looking at the kind of smaller details of uh, the overlooked parts of river watching and river walking especially as it moved towards COVID lockdown. We have Ifa Lal's Mother Nature, a book of poetry that looks at loss, motherhood, new parenthood, and the life that comes along with it. It's incredible poetry. We have Roddy Murray's Bleak, a book about the Ab Outer Hebrides and about art school in the 70s and 80s, featuring quite a heavy cameo from Peter Capaldi, who uh, was in a punk band with Roddy at the time. We also have L. McNichol's A Kind of Spark, which is an incredible coming of age story about a young girl with autism. But we've also got these two writers here this evening as well. Now, what I wanna do is just first of all, introduce Graham Armstrong. Now this is his book here, The Young Team. Graham Armstrong is a Scottish writer from Airdrie. His teenage years were spent within North Lanarkshire's gang culture, Alongside overcoming his own struggles with drug addiction, alcohol abuse, and violence, he defied expectations to read English as an undergraduate at the University of Stirling. After graduating with honours, he returned to a master's in creative writing. He regularly volunteers with the community, visiting prisons and schools, giving talks on his experiences of gang culture, substance abuse, uh, and he promotes a message of anti-violence and abstinence-based recovery. His best-selling debut novel, The Young Team, is inspired by his own experiences and was published by Picador in March of 2020. It won the Betty Trask Award, a Somerset Mall Award, and the Scots Book of the Year for 2021. In 2021, Graham also uh, presented Scotland the Rave, a documentary screened by the BBC that explored Scotland's rave and PC DJ culture. I hope I pronounced that last bit right. I'm a Cayley man myself, but uh, PCDG, I, I, I presume. Alongside Graham, we've also got Vanessa Harryhausen with this book here. Vanessa Harryhausen is a trustee of the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation and is a Ray's daughter. Vanessa grew up around her father's films and creations, being on the set for all his films from the Valley of the Guangai until Clash of the Titans. Vanessa later became a trustee of the foundation and is passionate about preservation and promotion of her father's legacy. She's a hands-on involvement with the foundation's ongoing projects and assists with the cataloging and rehousing of her father's material. This is Vanessa's first book entitled Re Harryhausen, Titan of Cinema, and it was published by the National Galleries of Scotland in 2020, uh, released to coincide with her father's centenary. Outside of the foundation, Vanessa is a member of the Scottish Castle Association and has an ongoing as involvement with the David Livingston Centre in Blantyre. Uh, as well as this, she is an accomplished illustrator, having attended City and Guilds, obtaining a diploma and degree in illustration. So those are the precursors over and done with, but a personal thing to say how delighted I am to have you both here this evening. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. So part of this evening is really to discuss and hear about your thoughts and your own experiences with writing. Um, so I want to just start things off and just discuss, or just to hear from you both, 
about beginning the project? You know, how did each of you find that process? Um, do, do you want to talk a little bit about your own kind of experiences of, with it, Vanessa? Um, yes. Um, people had approached me or friends and said that, you know, maybe it'd be interesting to write something about dad's life and, and my experiences. And I sort of thought, well, really, would that float everybody's boat? Because what have I really got to say? I mean, it's they're more into his films, not his personal life and, and stuff like that. So um, I had to think long and hard how I was going to do it. I think you said to me earlier uh, as well that there was a, a slight um, issue your dad had with this, all of this as well, was there not? Yes, he, he mentioned a long time ago, he used to, he was a fan of Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. And I think he read some of their old biographies written by their children. And they weren't very complimentary about their parents. And over breakfast one time, he says, dear, you're not going to write about a book about me, are you, when I'm dead? And I went, no, dad, of course not. What am I going to say about you? Who wants to listen to what I've got to say? And here I am now, you know, I've written a book about our family life and, and his life. And Did you find it a long process? I mean, tell us a bit about coming together. To, you know, how long did it take really to to come up with the idea to go along with it? Because I should say one of the important things is this is a show that's still on right now, at the, the Gallery of Modern Art in Edinburgh, is that correct? Through till February, 2022? Yes. So we've got a few months left. So this is, it's an incredible kind of a joiner to that. But I mean, from conception, did, did, was that always a plan to, to have this coincide with the exhibition or? No, not really. I, um, I think the galleries approached me because they thought it would be nice to have a personal touch of like a little catalogue book or something. Um, and, uh, you know, living with this collection and having so many personal pictures and everything, they said, sure, you know, would you like to try and think about some, putting something together? So, you know, it took a long time processing all the, the wonderful pictures and experiences that I, I had. Um, and uh, I just didn't feel very confident because I suffer from mild dyslexia. Mm -hmm. So it, um, it was a little bit of a slow process and I wanted to write it how I, I talk so that people would sort of feel like I it just wasn't sort of melosomatic, you know, it, was, it had feeling to it, like I'm talking to you. Um, so I was not sure how to get that across, but I guess by what everybody said, I, I've, I've achieved it. I don't know how, but I've achieved it. So. No, I think that's one of the beautiful things about it is, as you see, you've managed to write so beautifully about your relationship with your father and the creative side of your father's work, but you've also drafted in so many other different voices from across his, his life, his career to kind of just give different vantage points. I mean, I think that's what's incredible about this book is not only does it span a lot in terms of the actual, the artistry, the creations, but it's it, it's a real history of his life as well. So it kind of serves the two functions on that as well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I wanted it to be for, I mean, I think most people know him for his films and I wanted to bring in all his other talents that I grew up with, that I knew that he was a painter, he could do metal work, he did beautiful sculptures and all that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what the National Galleries also, um, you know, managed to achieve in their exhibition, all his other talents, you know. So, um, yeah, hopefully it's a book for everybody that will have a little bit of inspiration for, for young folk, photographers, filmmakers, mm -hmm. artists, young animators. No, definitely. I mean, one of the beautiful things is six months before I even received this book, I was uh, introducing my son to uh, Jason and the Argonauts, you know, so it just felt so timely just to say, you know, and then all of a sudden the exhibition's on, the book is somehow in my hands. And yeah, it's just been beautiful because I think that's really, it just displays its timeless quality. I've got more to ask you about that actually in a wee moment, but I want to take Graham in here as well and just find out a bit about his experiences because I mean, you know, even talking through your biographical note there, it shows, you know, what part, you know, how, how did you feel about even setting out to, to write this book, you know, to, to start going down the path of literature and writing and everything else? 
I think it was a it was quite a strange moment in my life in that way. You know, I had uh, had I suppose what you'd been to call an epiphany at Christmas. You know, I'd kind of hit rock bottom. You know, with this trajectory of life. You know, um, with gangs and drugs, and I hit rock bottom. You know, and that's a moment lots of addicts talk about. And I had an epiphany. You know, I found faith, and I went to church instead of the with the gang that night. And I promised my mum, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it this time. She turned it all before, guys. You know, I tried <laughs> and failed a million times to go off drugs. And uh, it's a very sad thing when your mother doesn't believe in you anymore, but she didn't, it's, you know. So I, but I did it, you know, I, I stayed off, guys, and I went socially distant in 2012. So I was pacing about my living room like a madman. And uh, and I was desperate for something to do to keep me away from old friends and old habits. And Eardry, I was in a, a flat in uh, Stirling at the time. And um, I just started writing. And it was the kind of ravens of a, you know, a madman who was in drug lifter, I suppose, at the time. And um, it kind of took a strange format. I don't, I don't think I've ever told anyone this. It was like a non-fiction essay. And uh, and it was about the marketing of ecstasy tablets. And it was like in a weird non-fiction and fiction hybrid form. Uh, and that's what I submitted for my, my dissertation in university at the time. And then obviously the non-fiction stuff started to be peeled back. And then it was just pure fiction. Uh, so it was a strange experience. I mean, the incredible thing is, you know, again, all the awards that were mentioned as part of it, but... You know, as you're talking about, this started in when did you say 2012? Yeah, 2012. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was I was only 21 at the time, uh, so I was very young. I, I don't think there was much craft going on. There, there might have been some talent, but not not craft. You know? <laughs> but um, it's quite strange. Lots of the book that, that was written back even in those early days is, is very close to what you'll see now. Um, it just took a very long time, and it is a publishing process. You know. Most yeah. of it was written between the ages of 21 and 23. And it was just improved upon and refined over the years. And the, so other, the other thing, uh, I, saw, I was reading, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was reading a load of, a load of things, uh, a few other interviews with you as well. And I think I was at Glasgow Live, they had a bit online that said it's maybe at one point was about 250,000 words. And then you've um, kind of trimmed it and trimmed it down as well. Yeah, wow. and I think it maxed out two hundred and thirty six thousand words. Um, and I realised this was too long, of course. Yeah. Right? I had I had read online in one of these writing forums that it was one two five, so it was practically double the length, and that was the kind of accepted norm lengthwise. And uh, so I cut it back uh, to two hundred thousand. And when I had my first contact with a literary agent, <laughs> he said. This is good, but honestly, it's far too long. I need to get from that many cutting 50,000 words in it. There was no even a mention of what words I have to cut. It was just just cut, you know. So um, I just I, I just cut, you know. It was like surgery. So I just cut away 40, 50,000 words of the, the additional stuff. And then he signed me immediately after that, actually. Um, it was just that show of commitment, you know. Because mm-hmm. after six years, God, you would you'd do pretty much anything, you know, if he asked me to do it. Um, so I did it, and that was, that was the start, really, and then within six months it was signed by Picador, so after six years it happened it, relatively quickly. Yeah, that's, 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 that's incredible, just like, but I just can't get over the fact that it was, you know, 2012, and then it's, there's just such a long process with, with all of it, I mean, but to move things on to, like, this idea of, like, an internal critic and to, you know, who, somebody who's there is kind of strengthen the work, but also maybe is a little bit overbearing. Did, I mean, did either of you have a sense of that when you were going through this? I mean, Vanessa, did you feel, that, you know, quite a lot of responsibility because you're doing this, you know, in terms of your father's legacy as, as much as anything else? I mean, was that part of it for you or did you feel, you know, it was a joyful kind of unburdening, in the, you know, as part of it? It was, a, it was a bit of both. It was very emotional um, because I lost my parents both not, you know, within a few months of each other. Um, and it was, yeah, it was very emotional, especially at the end when I, I wrote the, their sad demise, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, I just wanted to speak from the heart and, and that takes you in a different mode, you know, and you don't know whether you're being too emotional to the reader or whether it be of interest or, or what. So I guess there's sort of a line that you you have to sort of draw not to get too embedded into emotional stuff. Did, did you find, you know, because you're going through a huge amount of archive, I mean, that's that's obvious that's said in the book. I mean, there, there's a, a favourite part of, of mine in the book, I mean, basically from my geek side of things, to do with a, a wee note from Peter Jackson. But was there any, like, pieces that you 
came across that you just had no idea had been had been there and that suddenly there was just found stuff the way in some random place um sometimes it's sketches on backs of um notepads or in between pictures or you know or you'd find a bit of armature or something and you you know it's, it's sort of a discovery every time because he he was bless him a little bit of a hoarder but he also <laughs> shoved away and and so it's still we're still finding stuff today so it's 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 a delight really it's 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 always fun to go through the collection and that and in terms of uh including or not including things i mean one of the the things for yourself graham is the inclusion of of different like you talk about you know drug use and ecstasy and everything but i was thinking as well about you know representation of stuff like god's kitchen and ray mm -hmm. festivals i mean did you feel that was kind of intimidating to represent or did you feel like an anarchic delight in putting it down on a page you know when it's, it's not often represented i um I, I think it was a difficult experience you know i, I sat with that and I thought, how do i write a rave you know a rave's a kind of like cacophony of um sensation you know light color noise smell um, and I just wanted to evoke it in that way, you know, and of course there's a heritage in our generation, I'm glad you mentioned the PC DJs, by the way, but we are seen as the kind of baby ravers, the wee kind of cheesy 2000s guys, you know, who followed in and we had kind of chipmunk vocals and it wasn't this kind of cool acid house, everybody swearing in rhythm, you know, it's a bit happy hardcore and a bit rough around the edges, you know, so I, I just wanted to do our generation's uh, justice, you know, our experience. But it was funny, by the way, because the, the first rave one, raving in the bedroom, almost didn't make it. They didn't. They weren't sure about that because they said they don't spend any time in the rave. And I said, no, no, that's what it's all about. <laughs> you know, it's, it's about the build up and rave day, we used to call it. And it was like a, a huge event. And, you know, um, <laughs> it was almost more important than the rave. The rave was just a, a drug fueled merry-go-round, you know, that lasted nine or ten hours. And. The memories of the actual individual moments are quite hard to pick out, so it was more sensation for mm -hmm. you know. But you're right, loads of heritage, so it was a it was a responsibility. I'm finding that quite expert to be honest with you. Um, but uh, and again, was, was there was there a joy in putting it down on the page? Though I mean, I think that oh, most de most definitely, it was like <laughs> quite a hallucinogenic narcotic experience. I think you know, and um, it's a very difficult thing. Ecstasy, of course, was the predominant substance we used. You know. Um, and it's a hard one to kind of put on paper, you know, it's a very feeling uh, substance mm -hmm. and a drug, you know, not that I'm advocating it's just at all, um, you know, but I, and it, it's a fine balance between glorification of class A drug yeah. use, because of course, you know, there's lots of young people have lost their life taking that drug, so um, I, it was a very kind of, you know, not a moralistic stance anyway, you know, which, and I would say other drug use in the book is looked at in a moralistic way, you know, but the ecstasy was just purely an experience. Um, it was just part of it. Mm -hmm. And you didn't experience much in terms of pushback from, from editors or agents or anything along those lines? Were they quite excited about this? Or? I think they just let me run with that one a little bit. I'm quite surprised some of it got in because it's just, as he's just kind of talking gibberish in the middle of it, you know, he's, he's kind of recounting uh, kids' TV programmes he used to watch on CITV and all that and talking about Jungle Run and Hey Arnold. And his, I mean, <coughs> this is not a hallucinogenic drug, you know, visually, but it's a, it's a, it causes almost a confusion in the brain. You know, and people would kind of say random things that didn't make any clear sense, you know. Um, and you're just, I was trying to capture that and create a sense of confusion. I think it worked. I think it worked. People do enjoy it. And then after the first wave, of course, is the, you know, it's the morning after the night before. And it's this kind of um, infernal hangover come down scene, you know, and it's a very highly written, I don't know, I had fun with that. Anthems for Doom Juice, you know, after the, the Wilfred Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's just... <laughs> Yeah, no, but there's so many, like, I don't know, I just found it really refreshing. I mean, we'll talk in a little bit about, there's some probably likely um, comparisons people will oft, or, often make, and we can talk about maybe blowing that out a little bit more. But, I mean, in terms of yourself there, Vanessa, as well, you know, talking about things that are often unrepresented, one of the things, you know, in terms of even the films I was showing my son was, you know, Jason and the Argonauts and then there's Simbad and there's a few real kind of tentpole films that are best known by your father. But I mean, was part of it as well about bringing to light underrepresented parts of his work and his life? Um, yeah, I just, I just wanted to bring 
forward um, his more artistic side that people probably didn't know so much about. Yeah, I mean, do, uh, do, I think it might be a nice time. We've got a little bit of a slideshow kind of prepared just to discuss or just to highlight some of the things that we're dis uh, talking about here. And I think at this point, it might be nice to have a bit of a visual aid just to, to go through. So do you want to talk us a little bit about this? Yeah, this is the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation that Dad set up for preservation and conservation of his creatures and the work that he did. And he set it up for encouragement to for young students and people and animators. He wanted to save his collection so that he could inspire the younger generation. And it doesn't matter what background you're in, you know, if you've got a talent for whatever, he he. He wanted to be some kind of inspiration, and I guess it's it's worked because his fans and you guys have kept his memory alive. So that's why the Harryhausen Foundation was set up to sort of hopefully help in the future, you know, younger folk and um, you know to to get to see this and and experience and you know learn from the old style. Mm -hmm. And there I am, that's, that's me holding a, um, an, an elephant that was in the Valley of Guanji. And I named, well, I think he was named Pinky. Um, and I grew up with all these wonderful creatures around me. So I was very fortunate um, to, to have them around. And I remember dad doing, um, we've got Pegasus on the, on the side there, doing that um, in his office. So, you know, he was, um, I was able to just go upstairs and see him work away at some of his models. This is the cave bear. And believe it or not, everybody always asks, is it true that your granny cut up her fur coat for your dad to make the bear? And I went, yes, that's a story that I heard. So um, that is part of granny's fur coat. <laughs> donated to dad because you know, he, he grew up during the depression and it was obviously very hard to get materials. And um, I guess they believed so much in, in what he was doing that um, she kindly helped him do that. And those are my grandparents there. And um, that's my grandfather in a, a pose for, for dad, I guess. These pictures I remember fondly of, again, you know, he had his studio upstairs in his office and a big easel. And I remember him drawing these right there, you know. Um, so I was lucky enough to see the, the sketches and then um, the, 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 the models and then the life-size creatures later on. And that's daddy in his teeny little studio there. And he, he did all sorts of things in there and made wonderful sculptures and stuff. And he used a lot of dental tools to, to do some of the sculptures and um, textures of, of, of the creatures. And it's just a teeny little room, you know, it's, it's amazing what, <laughs> what you can create in, in a back room. And this was his study upstairs on the top floor. And I used to sit on that couch many a time. I'd bring him up an Earl Grey tea and we'd sit and discuss things and he'd either be typing away or sketching or, you know, something. And he, he made all these cabinets in the background that you see there um, himself. So, you know, I was surrounded by it all the time and it was, it was fantastic. It really was. And here, the famous scene with um, Jason and, you know, fighting the skeletons. Um, and this little skeleton here, um, he was one of the touring ones. And dad made that little coffin that you see there. Um, and he used to take it on tour. And he used to have a little bag sometimes by him on stage. And then he'd pull out this little coffin and then produce a gushier or this the skeleton for the, for the fans and they were thrilled, but he made that especially for that, that skeleton so he could travel around. This is my favorite. This is Guanji from the Valley of Guanji. And I used to play with this when I was a child. Um, 
there is a story that two grannies um, or old ladies um, had a, a talk with my mother in Harrods and they wanted to see my baby buggy and I see the dolly in the baby buggy and I pulled back the cover and there was one <laughs> and they were horrified and said that child's never going to be normal <laughs> <laughs> um but who wants to be normal you know it's sometimes nice to be a bit different yeah. but so uh, yeah again um you know and there's me as a wee kitty on dad's lap on the set of um valley of guanji i think it was And here, people ask me what the connection, the Scottish connection between, you know, Livingston and, um, well, my, my father and, and uh, my mother. And, and my mother was the great, great granddaughter of David Livingston, the explorer. And my dad loved the story of all Livingston's exploits and, and trials and tribulations through Africa. So he did this wee sculpture that you see on mm -hmm. the... I don't know what side it would be on the left side of me, um, the small one, and asked a, a lovely guy from Northern Ireland, I think it was Gareth Knowles, to do a big life-size one, which you see there. And it's at Blantar in, um, near Glasgow at the David Livingston um, Centre. And this is the only big life-size model that my dad ever did in public. But he wanted to honour my mum and her ancestry with David Livingston, and that's how he did it. And there's dear mummy and daddy at um, um, one of the awards that we were at, and, um, and then me giving dad a, a hug when I was wee in California. And that was a garage that I found a lot of stuff. He, he sent me out many years later and, and he couldn't remember if he had stuff there and said, oh, would you go out and have a look? And I think I came back with something silly, like 18 or 19 boxes of treasures that he'd forgotten about. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's it, is it? Yes. Incredible, <laughs> like absolutely incredible in terms of the, all the details of it. I mean, what was it like growing up in such an environment? Um. I know this sounds really weird, but it was just sort of normal. It's like, you know, when you have a lamp and you, and, or, or I don't know, an article in your house that you see it all the time. It's always been there since you can remember. And it was sort of like that. These creatures were always upstairs. And then later on, when he started doing his sculptures, they would be downstairs in the hallway. So they were always, always there. So I was a little bit blasé about it. And it was only when my friends came to visit maybe when I was at boarding school and they'd come and they'd go, oh my God, look at that, you know, and I'd go, all right, okay. And then I sort of think that, you know, okay, it's a bit different. <laughs> but in terms of things, I mean, just to return to the, the, the quote I like from Peter Jackson, I mean, the thing I loved about it was saying, you know, the film he was on, Lord of the Rings, he was saying, Lord of the Rings is a son, or a son of Harryhausen or a child of Harryhausen. And you just think, you know, not only has your father created all these incredible objects, creations, he's kind of also moved on to that next level of being the actual imagination that moves the hands of the, the people coming through. I mean, it's just fantastic to see and it's it, glorious, you know, to, to, to have done what you've done in terms of, you know, again, bringing this to the world, not only in the, the exhibition that's traveling here and there and everywhere, but, but in this book form as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted folk to see a different side. You know, I mean, all gen genius men, clever men have their moody moments. And, and I put some of the moody moments in the book with a bit of humor and that. And to just show that he is, you know, he had his good days like we do all, all of us, you know. Um, and uh, just from my view and then some friends, close friends, I added into the book. Um, but I wanted it from my heart. I didn't want it too gushy. So again, that compromise, I'm not a professional. I had no idea how to set this out. So at the very beginning, I just sort of wrote down on a piece of paper ideas. And then I had to sort of match those ideas with possible pictures and with that go. Um, and it sort of went from there, but it was quite hard because there's so much in the collection and I 
you know, it's so familiar to me. I mean, where do you start, you yeah. know? Yeah, I suppose that's it. You're having to look at it from an outside point, point of view, like showcase this or showcase this, or wh where do you kind of go go on that side of it? Um, just just to pull in Graham a little bit here as well. I mean, in terms of like showing a different angle, I mean, I think that's a that's a lovely idea from Vanessa. I mean, as I said, you know, writing in terms of you know the grittier parts of Scottish life, you're going to have the inevitable comparisons and. Uh, you know, people comparing you to to Irvin Welsh or people along these lines, and but you know, you've talked quite a bit about you know when, when we were having a conversation before about other people who've really inspired you and kind of kicked you along the the line of of writing. So, do you want to talk a little bit about that and you know who they were and how they got you started and bits like that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the uh, people say like the comparisons to Irvin Wells are inevitable, but they're, they're a huge honour for me as well, you know, because that was the bit that kind of started the, and like the creative fuse, you know, that, that started mm -hmm. all this. Um, but we, we do fall into the trap of looking, holding everything up to the light to see if it's got a Welsh shoe or a train spot and watermark, you know. Um, and for me, like there was two at the time when I was studying masters, um, Jenny Fagan and Kerry Hudson had just burst onto the scene in the kind of early 2010s. Um, and their work was, it reminded me that especially Kerry's work very much of um, Jesse Kesson, the White Bird Passes, you know, um, it was, I suppose that's almost one of the first social realism books that came out of Scotland. She was the kind of godmother and she didn't get any credit, you know, I thought that was a good book. Mm -hmm. But um, So I was all female and, you know, um, and my tutor at the time was was uh, Kathleen Jamie, of course, just named Scotland's marker. And the, the writer uh, in residence was Janice Galloway. So, I mean, I was surrounded by um, strong female talent, you know. Uh, so that, that had a huge impact on me. And I, I feel that we do lean on the male uh, voices a lot, you know, Kelman and uh, Welsh, especially for, for Scots dialect stuff, but Tom Leonard as well. Uh, my gran used to have um, little bits of paper and of course like pre computer days someone must have created these for her and written them out and it was all Tom Leonard's poems and she loved them because they were written phonetically and I had no idea that would come to be such a, a big part of my life you know it was it was weird it's such a strange memory that's beautiful I love that <laughs> Tom Leonard poems just written out like yeah, that yeah that's just written out you know and she she kept them in a the door you know old school yeah uh, that that um, slideshow, I, I must say, that slideshow took me back years to a uh, Sega game I used to play with my sister, Goldmax. I think they ripped off the, the Jason and the Argonauts, the skeletons. With the, it took me back years. Do, I, I was actually seeing this to, to Vanessa. One of the, the I, I, I had not um, like really understood, you know, the, the legacy when you know because I, it was only recently I was reading a, a an interview with Guillermo del Toro. The, the filmmaker and he was saying this is pure Harryhausen this is Harryhausen this is Harryhausen I think what's a Harryhausen you know and then you actually go and google it and you're like all these things from my childhood you know that now I've got a name and now is but again the, this is the 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 genius of the book is is making this so that it's not just like a byword in small circles and intimate circles it's more common it's more spread throughout but again, there was a guy and uh, there was a guy in here his nickname was Sinbad so I, I don't know how he acquired that nickname <laughs> Uh, but there you go, you know, his influence is far felt. <laughs> God bless. And uh, what about yourself? I mean, Graham, in terms of, uh, you know, you, you mentioned so many wonderful tutors there. Uh, in, in a funny comparison, Kathleen was actually a tutor of mine as well. Um, oh, yeah. But, I mean, how, how did you feel supported by, by Kathleen, by Janice Galloway, you mentioned? I mean, the whole, the side of it, how did you feel kind of nurtured throughout? Stirling University was absolutely phenomenal with me. Um, the Scottish literature expert was a Canadian gentleman, Scott Hames, and uh, he he was showing my work, you know, when I had just presented it to the uni, and he and he and he came and kind of pulled me over the side and he went, "I should have realised about you. You always used to sit up the back, um, and you didn't look that engaged. But when we did train spotting, you never even opened your book and you could practically quote from it, you know. But Kathleen was tough, you know." She, uh, she certainly didn't suffer fools gladly, as I'm sure you know. Um, she's not, <laughs> she, you know, but that that's because you know she was doing, she was driving a level of excellence, you know, um, mm -hmm. and especially with reading, you know, and, and oral performance in the class because I was in with um, in a poetry environment, you know, as a prose writer, um, I think my reading was better, you know. I've had a lot of compliments with the audiobook and about delivery and performance, and people have said it's like a one man play and. 
I totally credit the uni for that, you know, and about the readings in class. And of course, Janice Galloway, well, Janice Galloway went on to mentor me. She kind of spotted me because I had a, you know, a, a working class Airdrie accent amidst these creative writers. And she said, what's your story? You know, and I had said, well, you know, I'm, I'm a former gang member and uh, I'm starting to write this book. And she mentored me, you know, and she, it was her who kind of encouraged me to take the, the professional steps. So I owe them a lot, you know, mm -hmm. fundamental part of it. It's, it's just that. It's just about who, who are those people that really, you know, support you and take you along the side. I, I'm entirely with you on Kathleen Jamie there. It's just been such a strong influence and it's incredible to see it spreads across not just poetry but prose as well and what about yourself Vanessa did you have somebody that you feel uh, just to interrupt I'll, I'll get to that question if anybody does have questions that they want to ask in the audience please just pop it in the chat because we're going to make some time at the end there just to open this up to other people and not have me blathering but please do any questions at all for either of the writers just do pop that in there but yeah is, was there anyone you felt that kind of helped push this forward in terms of, of a process or, I mean, even with your illustration background as well, you, you feel kind of supported that or how your dad influenced that side of things? Um, yeah, well, um, people asked if I was ever interested in the film business and I, I sort of would like, would have liked to do um, sort of backdrops and, um, you know, sets and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then I went into illustration and that. So at City and Guild and, um, and then it sort of slipped. So I haven't, I'm, I'm sort of on and off doing it again um, now. But um, yeah, dad was very encouraging. And, you know, he was encouraged by um, artists like Gustave Doré and American artists and um, Remington and, and all sorts of, of, of different artists. So he was very encouraging in all things. Um, and, you know, being in a, a, that kind of environment, it sort of fed my interest and once I wanted to know I was called a why child because why why is <laughs> why that and dad would go get that book and you'll find out why <laughs> you know so um yeah he was um it was it was it was a good childhood it really was inspirational exactly inspirational I was just going to ask exactly that I mean do you find not even it might be your father, might be an offshoot of your father, like everything that was surrounding you in this house. I mean, in terms of your illustration, did, did, did that bleed in quite a lot or did you end up going up on a, a tangent of your own or? Um, he was a hard, hard critic. Really? He loved anatomy and he absolutely chewed out and spat out my stuff. If it didn't have a proper form, it was no yeah. good. Yeah. Go do anatomy, go do this. I mean, he was, because that's what he did at school. He had to go to night school. He had to work his socks off to get where he was. And he just persisted. Um, I was a little bit more lazy. Um, <laughs> not so much into the, the bone structure, more of the feel and the texture of things. Um, but uh, yeah, he was, he, was, he was a hard critic. But um, yeah, amazing artist so many different techniques and stuff is that how he kind, of, he kind of created these monsters and almost from like outside sort of the inside out you know bone structure then tissue and then movement and everything kind of stemming from that i mean it must have yeah been he cool. wanted to, uh, like with his film that he loved king kong he wanted to know how did it move how did they do it so he went back to willis o'brien and he found out what they put in that creature what was in that creature so it was a metal armature like a, a, a you know, your arm, it had bolts and nuts and mm -hmm. things so that you could still move, move the joints and have that dexterity. Um, so he, he, he took a long time in, in learning that. And he had critics too, but he, he always said to me, you know, his harshest critic was, I think, Willis O'Brien and some other people who said that his dinosaurs' legs were like sausage legs. <laughs> Uh, go back and you know but he didn't take it as an insult he thought okay fine I'm going to do better and he just yeah. went on you know so what I've got to say to people out there if people do criticize you try not to take it it is hard getting the truth slapped mm -hmm. in your face but just walk with it and take the bits that are good out of it it may take some time and it's not going to be an easy ride I mean well done to Graham for writing that soul hearting book about his experiences and and his gang life and his achievements and 
you know, I commend you for that because that's hard to put that on a page to so many people judge and to bear your soul like that. So I, I really do commend him on that. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's it. We're just going to be, the whole of Scotland will be singing both your praises pretty soon, I would say. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I mean, in terms of your father, though, did, did he have any particular, you know, favourites in his own work? You know, is there any bits that he, you know, at the end of his life was just like, no, that's the, these are these are my my treasures that he maybe looked after better than other parts or anything along those lines that you you think? Um, he always said to me, he thought he could always do better. And I'm like, seriously, you're kidding me. And he said, well, you know, could have done this and could have that. But I think these great geniuses always think they can do better. Um, and he didn't like to try and have favorites. I mean, he did. He was very, as I said, he was very influenced by um, King Kong and, and all that. Um, and he loved new technology. And he knew that when he retired after Clash of the Titans, that it was time for another generation to come in with a different mm -hmm. viewpoint and aspect in, in, in animation, you know? So he was, he was interested in that, but he, he stepped aside because obviously it's, it's a hard life, you know, and he wanted to have some family time. Um, but he also wanted to influence the, you know, the younger generation from making, you know, even if it was just plasticine models, go ahead and do it and get that inspiration. And, you know, I, I want to carry this through here with, with the exhibition that's in Edinburgh and, you know, this book, all the young folk out there, please don't give up whether you're writing or you're doing, you know, just, it's, it's hard when you've got some, some people are very negative, but you've got to just try and find that little belief in yourself to, to do it because you can do it um, and just persist. No, I, uh, nothing but echo on, on that sentiment. Graeme, can I ask you to tell the, the story you were saying the other day about the, you know, talking about outside influence and having influence on in others, you, your work in the prison and the, and the mural there. Uh, we're going to be getting to the questions quite soon. So again, if anyone has a, has a few, we're going to be making a little bit of time for it. But please, can you, do you mind telling us a bit about that? Um, so the first opportunity I had to go into prison was just uh, before my book was published and it was at a recovery cafe talking about um, drug addiction. Um, and I was I was quite nervous to go in, to be honest with you, because um, by some miracle, I actually never ended up in prison. Um, you know, and the miracle was obviously finding, you know, the love of literature and that, that rode out, you know, the detail. Um, and that was one of the first things I said to the guys. I said, you know, I, lots of people told me I would end up here, but I certainly don't think they would have expected me to be reading on uh, work, work, of, work of fiction, you know. So um, I went in, you know, very much I just a... Uh, quiet sat in the corner and observed kind of thing and I read the book about drug addiction and the guys were really kind and you know I, I actually find it's easier to go into a prison than a school um, and I made a joke and I tell a story often about it being a captive audience you know I said no we're not going anywhere so they need to listen but actually in prison they're not a captive audience you know every guy who either goes to a recovery cafe to talk about drugs or they opt for education uh, has chosen to be there Skills are a captive audience, you know, they, they need to turn up and if a guy like me is wheeled in to talk about the issues, you know, they just need to sit and listen um, about the, the prison. So I, I did that and then um, I went into Berlin last year and I, I ran an English course. So I did six classes, so I, I, an initial class and then a follow-up. Um, just talking through issues in the book and all of those guys read The Young Team and um, some of them had never read a book before. Like grown men, you know, um, which is very... Um, touching for somebody like me, of course, with my background, you know, that you're having an impact like that. And, you know, they said they're reading other books and, you know, and it's the start of something you've created. Uh, some, the energy that was put into you, the train spot, has been transferred, you know, it can't be the created or destroyed, you know. Um, and recently, um, the guys who had done that course, they, are, they were asked if they wanted to do a graffiti wall. So they basically took a full wall of the learning centre and they just... Uh, covered it in young team stuff and it, some of the art was absolutely phenomenal you know it was like Lacoste logos and okay. the kind of brand insignia the, the crocodile you know the bear class stuff and then um, in other words it was lines out of the novel you know and you could see the kind of detail and the intricacy of it it was beautiful honestly it was very touching I was quite speechless actually um, you know and one of the guys who had done that he had written a poem as part of the class but he never managed to get on the group I was but I managed to get it published um, part by the Literary Alliance of Scotland, you know, and it was part of this linguistic uh, essay 
you know, and I told him he was a published poet, you know, so <laughs> he was like, oh, you know, it was great. Honestly, I, I've learned so much from them as well. Um, and I'm, I'm back right now running a course on mental health and masculinity. So um, you end up just blethering, you know, and, and the guys have got plenty to say. They're not, uh, they're not shy, you know, so definitely, absolutely worthwhile. No, beautiful. I mean, genuinely to see both things like just go out and, you know, the, the perfect type of literature just to get out of there, you know, to, to go and influence people's lives, you know, be it artists, be it people wanting to turn their, their lives around, um, you know, beautiful examples. Now, I've discovered there is a Q&A tab here. And I was worrying that there weren't questions. We've got quite a few questions here. So thanks for your patience on that side of things. Um, first one here is actually for Vanessa. So Graeme talked about media editing to work, you know, getting that word count down. Um, anything that you had to cut from the book, any kind of particular things that were difficult to drop or anything along those lines? Um, I, I wrote, I think it was 100 objects I had to write about. Um, and I wrote more, uh, more chapters just in case. And obviously the editors and the, the, the book publishers had to edit it all down. Um, and uh, it was it was it was quite hard to choose which bit, but they sort of nudged me in the right direction. They thought the reader would be more interested in, mm -hmm. so I just went with it because I'm not, you know, I'm I'm happy to hold up my hand and say I don't know the first thing. If you think this is going to be okay, so I went with it. But yeah, there were some stories and things that it would have been nice to put in, but I think they did a good job in choosing what I had written. What's the literary equivalent of a director's cut? You know, you can get the extended version of the book, you know, an extra 10 chapters at the end or something along those lines. Awesome. Um, yeah. a, a further question, we've actually got one lined up for Connor as well, who's, who's been sitting there quite quietly. So some people are quite interested in what's going on there. So, uh, but uh, a, a second one here in terms of Graham, uh, Chris Wilson's here just asking, you know, was it an obvious choice to set it in Airdrie? I mean, he says, you know, it's a perfect location for it, but, you know, was it obvious to decide to do your hometown? I mean, or, or does this kind of just stem from the fact you were talking a lot of it was, you know, almost like a, a an essay you, you began writing? To be honest with you, I, I actually wrestled with that um, because I was expelled from my high school age 14. Uh, and I was then thrust into a new town. Airdrie and Coat Bridge are like two sides of the same dirty penny, you know. Um, but the, uh, you know, they're very different in a lot of ways culturally. You know, Coat Bridge is Labs the Irish Catholic, and there's a whole different influence there. And Airdrie's very Protestant, community dominated. Um, so I went to a new school. I didn't know anybody, you know. And the head teacher said to me, um, "If you think Airdrie was bad, you're out the frying pan and <laughs> fire." And boy, was I. Uh, the gang culture was a lot more <laughs> violent down there. It was much more partisan. Um, and I was frustrated in the middle of it and I didn't have a clue. So actually, a lot of the gang violence um, and, the, and that kind of, the gang politics was actually Coat Bridge I was writing about. You know, so it's an amalgamation. And I was worried, you know, very noble even at 21 that I didn't want to create a shrine, you know, and I didn't want to inspire young men. That's what I'm, you know, I was adamant uh, in this transformative state that I wanted to create. A, it was a cautionary tale, you know. So I, I almost purposefully made it kind of universal. It was everywhere, you know, and the gang names weren't specific. Um, so I only ever revealed Airdrie at the very last chapter with Airdrie boys. Mm -hmm. um, because as Airdrie, I'm from Airdrie, you know. Um, so yeah, no, it was difficult. No, uh, thanks, thanks for that. And um, in terms of Connor, are you okay answering a question here? Just because we do have a question from Jason just asking, do, do you mind talking a little bit about your involvement and maybe for yourself and Vanessa, are there any other Harry Housen books in the pipeline? Yeah, of course. So so if anyone's wondering why I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm the collections manager for the, the Ray and Diana Harry Housen Foundation. So I work closely with Vanessa on helping her to take care of her father's collection and preserve it for future generations to enjoy. And uh, I was obviously had a lot on my plate with the, the exhibition that's currently on in Edinburgh. But in terms of Vanessa's book, um, there's 50,000 items, at least here in the collection. There's a lot here. Ray 
kept everything throughout his life. And uh, my job really was to help to curate that a little and help Vanessa in narrowing that down to, to 100 objects, which is, you know, it's quite a lot there. But um, she selected a kind of short list of things she'd like to include. And I kind of helped her with pulling that material out, having it photographed, looking for uh, objects from different times in our, in our dad's life so that we kind of covered all of his his life and all of his films and all of the different things that he did throughout his uh, incredible career. And there's some incredible finds in there and some material that you know, people have maybe never seen before. Obviously, um, the publishers at the National Galleries of Scotland are very keen on the Skeleton Army and Medusa and Bubo the Owl and all of these uh, really famous creatures. But... Um, Ray kept all of this other material too that's, that's sort of personal to him. Uh, his first musical instrument, his zither, which he, which he learned to play in the, was it the 30s or the 40s, Vanessa, as a, a very young man? Um, I might have been sort of, yeah, near 30s, 40s, probably in between that, yeah. His early career, we found uh, we found some photography of um, he played the symbols on a on a re-recording of one of the film soundtracks for Mighty Joe Young. So we we encapsulated all of Ray's musical career there, his his zither <laughs> from the nineteen thirties, and then his his crashing of the symbols in in the nineteen nineties. So so yeah, I mean that it was it was a real pleasure to to work with Vanessa, and we did have a a very definite deadline. So, you know, we knew that the, the book had to be ready for 2020 for for um, race centenary and for the exhibition. So it was a case of Vanessa had all of this, as she said, written down on pieces of paper or, or in her mind, things that she'd like to talk about. And it was uh, helping her get that onto the, onto the screen and onto, uh, over to the publishers. And, um, you know, what a, what a joyous experience because um, it is a, a very interesting life story. And I think it can inspire any, um, people who are animators or people who are film lovers, but also people who just uh, are interested in raised determination and mm. sort of practical. Because the impression I get, I sadly didn't get to meet Ray. I joined you know, working with Vanessa a couple of years after Ray had passed away. But the impression I get from everybody that met him, that he was an incredibly generous and humble man, but mm -hmm. with this massive array of talents under the surface. And, uh, you know, he had a very focused um, idea of what he wanted to do. From the moment he saw King Kong in 1933, he's like, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life, whatever that is. There was no guidebook on how to make stop motion movies. And he kind of, he kind of uh, took it, um, took his own initiative and with trial and error ended up becoming this kind of one man special effects industry. And I think it's a fascinating tale. And what about next for you both, like Vanessa and Connor, are you next projects? You know, as I say, this is still running till February in the, in the museums, but are you going anywhere next? Are you creating any new books? Are you, you where, where, what happens next for the exhibition or for, for the foundation? We've got a couple of ideas to do some other things, and I, I might incorporate the chapters that weren't put in this mm -hmm. in another book with some other things, but it's sort of, we're just, it's still in the very seed um, idea at the moment. So we'll, we'll see, because there's lots of different angles you could do to inspire, you know, um, again, from dad, dad, dad's perspective of things. So, um, yeah, and, and I have to say that, you know, I couldn't have done this without Connor because I am, as I said, I've got mild dyslexia. I'm a very slow typer. Um, I'm a one finger girl. You know? <laughs> it's like, I'm not, I'm not like fast fingers. And he was just, God bless him. You know, I'd put these scribbles on paper and, and say, and then he would, he would type it out in a better fashion. And, and you know, so he was, he was really um, helpful for me on that. No, oh, that's that's brilliant. Uh, you know, again, even just getting to know you you both over the past few weeks, it's just been brilliant to see how how well you work together. Um, in terms of, we are getting quite close to the end, but just maybe a a wee last word from Graham there as well. We've got a question here about next projects. I mean, do you want to talk a wee bit about anything you're working on in, in terms of next books or next projects or upcoming upcoming things? So I am, yeah, I'm, I'm almost there on my next work of fiction, um, Raveheart it's called, it's, uh, it's very different in tone, I feel like I did the emotional heavy lifting with the young team, you know, and I've made people think, so now that's what I'm trying to make people laugh, you know, in Scotland the rave was a great precursor to that because it's a, it's a wacky rave comedy 
And uh, a new Conservative Party swept to power and they have banned rave in Scotland has erupted in rave paramilitary violence <laughs> um, with these ARAG anti-rave abolition groups. So it's, it's very much V for Vendetta, uh, 1984, a, a, a folk, you know, dystopian rave fiction. So, uh, it's, but it's turning into a real, a real <laughs> uh, massive book again. It's now, it's 140,000 words. I feel like I've barely scratched the surface. Um, so I, I, it's going to be epic. It's going to be fun. Who, who has that first? Does that go to your agent first or to, to the editor where yeah, that's, you're that's the one back. who say... That's, it's back in the fish, sir. it's back in the ocean, that one, so yeah. Um, but, I'll, need to dis- I'll need to hand that to my agent and it's, it's actually a very strange and crazy book. Um, uh, <laughs> my partner read a bit of it and she said it's like David Foster Wallace, it's absolutely weird and like people are going to think you're weird and crazy, I don't know if it's going to land and I say that, I'll be fine, don't worry. <laughs> was, was that part of it? I mean, was that part of it? You know, to as you say, you've done the emotional thing. You've you've written a lot about your your, your experiences and growing up, and you know, a lot a lot kind of drawn from own experiences. But then, just to, on the second bit, just to go right, wild. I think that's why it's so difficult because it's it's the art and the craft. It's pure invention. You know, of course, I've got a deep and um, profound love of dance music, and that's the lifeblood that runs through the project. You know, but uh, in, in essence, it's a, a work of creative fiction. There's no uh, life experience to draw on apart from rave culture, you know. Um, but all the, all the chapter names are song titles. Um, so I I don't know. It's probably going to be a, a, a libel nightmare and all that. <laughs> I told my agent that and she was like, we're going to get sued. <laughs> <laughs> nah. So I'm creating like an album list at the end of it, you know. And it, oh, the, the protagonist is called BJ Turbo, so... Uh, make it that way you will. He's the, the, the ice skating DJ in Coat Bridge. So uh, <laughs> the deposed ice skating DJ in Coat Bridge. Uh, <laughs> well, look, it's, crazy. it's weird. It's fun. Can't wait to be reading it as well when it when it comes out. Uh, but I think we're going to have to to start winding this up, and just to say thank you to to everybody who's been involved here, and to you know, Vanessa, to Graham. <laughs> Anybody on who does social media, please start talking about how incredible the evening was and to, to be able to listen to these two here. Um, because it's, it's really important that we do in Scotland celebrate Scottish culture, Scottish writing, and really do get it out there in a way that um, maybe in the past we haven't done quite so much. And I just think it's, especially with these books that you know, they're, they're, as we've kind of talked out through throughout the evening, are going out into places and doing so much for, for people. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much for everybody who's been here. And please do look at the Salter Society's website or investigate the others on the shortlist as well. 